That would be wonderful. Information, our website is- Wonderful interview time with our healthy group, Holistic Epilepsy Awareness and Loving, Transforming and Healing Yourself. And I'm coming from my hometown of Escondido. Uh, come out here where I used to pitch out here as a little league player. So I'm feeling a little old today, but feeling a little loved. <laughs> <laughs> like 40 years ago, I was on that mound back in my day. And <laughs> that's right about the time, right before my epilepsy started from a football injury and the time periods that I went through seizures, that I went through all kinds of issues for the next 10, 15 years of my life. And wonderfully, we have connected here with Stacy, with Liz and other people that we love to interview that have epilepsy, that live with epilepsy. My program itself is called Recovered Coaching and what I do and help other people with epilepsy and self-confidence and personal growth. So we're all coming here today too because I met Stacy earlier this year, wonderful coach, wonderful lady, author of like 30 plus books, <laughs> growing all over the place, getting out there. Stacy, I wanna introduce you and introduce our new guest here today. Hi, so I'm Stacy Chalemi, and I'm a health, lifestyle, and epilepsy coach, and I also am the founder of the completeherbalguide.com. I work with lots of people, teaching them how to help themselves and heal themselves naturally through different resources of ways of eating and ways of doing things um, health-wise, supplement-wise, and herbs, and, and, and all that other good stuff. And I also teach people about lifestyle and changing their lifestyle and how that can have a, a huge impact on their life. And I work with tons of people with epilepsy, helping them get through epilepsy because I developed epilepsy at the age of five. And I've had a roller coaster ride to say the least. And I am now controlled. My seizures are controlled. And I reach out to people and I help people with epilepsy, um, you know, take them through the steps of getting from one point to this point. So, you know, you can find me on my website at stacychalemi.com or at the complete completeherbalguide.com. Shoot me out a message if you need some help, and I'd love to work with you. I'm an advocate, and I'm also a speaker. I do lots of speaking events, so if you need me, I'm here. So today, we have a great guest. I'm so excited to introduce her today. Her name is Natalie Boehm, and she is an entrepreneur. She has an amazing story to tell you about her, her roller coaster ride with epilepsy. So I'm going to give the stage to Natalie now, and she's going to tell you about herself, and she's going to tell you about her story. And Natalie, we are so pleased to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for coming. And please, take it away. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Natalie Boyum. I'm the president and founder of the Defeating Epilepsy Foundation. We're a 501c3 here in Southern California. And our goal is to provide the advocacy and educational opportunities to the epilepsy community and our society. I developed epilepsy at the age of two due to a traumatic brain injury. And I could say my childhood and early adulthood was exactly what you've said about epilepsy. It's a roller coaster ride, but I've been very lucky that my seizures are now controlled I haven't lost consciousness in 18 years. Woo! What made me, thank you, <laughs> what made me create this organization is I found even with my seizures under control, I was afraid to let people know I had epilepsy for so many years. And because of it, I just saw the stigma wasn't going away. And I thought of the younger generations, how is this going to impact them if somebody finally doesn't step up to the plate? and really address the issue. So my goal is I offer a scholarship for students who are battling epilepsy to help them with higher education expenses. And I've created a program where I'm helping to collaborate with businesses and other nonprofits so that we can help people with uncontrolled epilepsy and veterans who have developed epilepsy or traumatic brain injury and or PTSD while serving in combat for them to be able to get a medical service dog because I really want to see people whose seizures aren't controlled you know as well as people who have been lucky enough to have their seizures controlled we really have to be there for one another to improve our quality of life I love the work you're doing about the herbal remedy that is something so many people don't talk about or I've heard oh you you shouldn't be using things like that I can say I've used CBD to relieve stress I have a CBD patch I use ashwagandha because I have chronic stress from epilepsy and P having PTSD That's myself. That's an excellent supplement. Go ahead. Yeah. So it, it, you know, little things, it's so important for us, for us, you know, battling epilepsy. We have to be 
we have to be our own advocates. There's no other way to put it. And we have to educate ourselves and be able to see what is in our best interest. And I find what has really helped me more than ever is I have a wonderful neurologist. The frustrations with the healthcare system I find is having to fight to find that one doctor or fighting with the, um, not even so much HMO, I'm finding it's the medical group now, so having mm-hmm. to file appeals. And this is why I need to see the doctor. And, and what it came down to, at least for me, I finally called the HMO with my frustrations with the medical group. And I said, here's what it is. I go, I want to be your most cost-effective patient. My goal is let my new doctor do the test he needs to do. Let me get a care plan together. And the goal is, is I just see him every six months. Let him know everything's cool. And then I don't see him for another six months. I said, I want to be with someone I can trust rather than in and out of the hospital, up and down on a bunch of meds. And let me find somebody who's a team player that I can trust and we can reach those goals. A hundred percent. And tell us about, you know, before the show came on, you were giving us a great story. You were telling us about how, you know, epilepsy affected your life growing up from childhood and on. So maybe if you don't mind, like let people understand like where it all started and how it made you feel, because you know what, there are so many people out there that even I could relate to you when you were talking that are going through the same emotions that you went through from childhood and on. And if you don't mind sharing that story, again I just like to take it from there and then we'll roll on because that story was amazing oh no thank you I'm more than happy to when I had my head injury at the age of two they put me on 90 milligrams of phenobarbital a day and that's what I followed for 10 years and my first 10 years of of being on this it was a blur I mean it was so hard to function being on a powerful barbiturate I did well in school, but trying to get up in the morning and get through a day, it was a fight every day. I felt exhausted all the time. I became emotional very easily. So people didn't think of me as, um, okay, something is wrong. There's more to this. I was a whiny little brat my parents were stuck with. And my neurologist at the time, the mentality was you do what the doctor tells you and don't question it. So my parents thought they were doing the right thing, following, you know, the protocol he wanted. And, you know, his response was, well, she has a seizure, call an ambulance. And that was the end of it. He never talked about things like physical occupational therapy to help me with my development. He never said to my mother, you know, maybe we should get her to a child psychologist with the way her emotions are and the struggles that she's having. Maybe working with someone and working with you, we can, you know, we can put together a plan to help, you know, alleviate some of the stress. My mother and father didn't know these services were available. My mother and father were just, you know, aggravated because here they were stuck with a sick child. And my family, you know, was very split on how to handle it. My grandparents wanted, you know, a more involved hands-on approach in helping and supporting me and having people understand I was going through a very challenging time and my family was there for me where my father's parents, you know, they loved me very much. But when they immigrated over their family, they started a business. They were they were entrepreneurs themselves. And they were afraid, well, if someone finds out, you know, she's sick and with this neurological disorder, will people stop doing business with us wondering why did this happen was, you know, Like you were saying about some other people have ran into you, their families were like, don't talk because they're going to think you're possessed. And I think my, my family or my father's family had that same attitude. It was be quiet. We'll deal with it somehow. And that really had an impact on me because things like socializing, it didn't happen. My mother didn't want me to go to sleepovers. What if I had a seizure when I went over with friends? There were, I wasn't allowed to play in sports, which I look back at the school and I say, why? Because exercise is probably the best stress reliever. People with epilepsy, you know, when they take part in things. So Mm -hmm. it was a very isolating, you know, teenage years where it was, I spent my, my teenage years in my early childhood alone in my room. And then once I turned 18, I went to, I started college at 20. I was really having a difficult time in my late teens, but my parents' attitude was you're an adult, get a job, figure out what you want to do, start school. 
And here you go from being alone to all of a sudden you're around a ton of people. And it really is, um, it's overwhelming. I mean, the social anxiety I had was just through the roof and I could become really um, irritated and anxious very easy. And, you know, people didn't, people didn't understand the attitude was, what's your problem? And they right. just, they just didn't realize, yeah, I did have a problem, but even at this point, I didn't even know where to start. It was exactly. for the longest time. It was like, like I said, with the, um, the doctor I had when I was younger, do as you're told and don't question. And I found where things started to change was I was stuck in this situation. I've been at this point bouncing on and off of different medications, like I was at Depico for four years. The side effects were so horrible. Oh, yeah. I attempted suicide twice. I just, my body, it, well, I was on Felbamate that knocked my white blood cell count in half. I mean, mm -hmm. a simple sinus infection I had here almost killed me. I went into status twice in less than 30 hours. Having having grandma seizures or now they're and back then, if you seizures. Don't adding, they, this is like in the nineties and, and even back in the eighties in my time, they said, Oh, let's try another medication. Let's try they don't even talk. They didn't talk about what the medication could do to you, the side effects. They just said, Well, it's not working. Why did they you also didn't it? have Thank a lot you. of medications out there? They were very back then we were very limited. We had, like you said, we had, you know, phenobarbital until they took it off the market and they realized how it was a barbiturate, how it how it was addictive, how how bad it could be for the body, and they stopped using it. We had Dilatin. Depakote yeah. and only a certain amount of drugs for epilepsy. And like you mentioned, they don't talk about the side effects. And to this day, they don't tell you, they write out, you out a prescription, but they, when do they ever, have, have you ever sat down with a doctor and they right away tell you the possible side effects? They don't, you have to no. look it up yourself. And that's what I do for drugs. my foundation. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt Stefan, but what I do for my, I have a YouTube channel. And I have a series called um, Epilepsy Medications. I define what kind of medicine it is, how it's known by ge generic and name brand, the history behind it, how was it created. I show the chemical structure that I find that on PubChem, how it works, the side effects and risk. And so many people were just so happy. They're like, I've been looking for this forever. I take all these beds. I don't even know what's going on with my body. And it really, um, like you, like we were saying before we start recording, when you're trying to look this information up because of the medical terminology, if you don't know how to break that terminology down, you're just looking at the information going, what? Where do I even start with this? But people have to also realize everybody reacts differently to medication. Like, yes. you know, their medication that I am on, if you look up the side effects, it's horrifying. But yeah. m the medications that I am on, I don't have any side effects from them. So you can't get, you can, you could look up the side effects so you have an idea what it possibly can do, but everybody reacts differently and you might get one or two of those side effects, or you may not get any of them. So you can't like, yeah. don't be discouraged from taking them. Try it. You know, if the doctor suggests that I want you to try this medication and then you look at all these side effects and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Don't get discouraged because you may not get those side effects. It's a yeah. possibility because you're those, the, the, what they do is when they put, um, when they're, when they invent these drugs, they do trial studies and then they very closely evaluate all the patients and they are required by law to mention any side effect that any person in these trial groups experienced. So just because they experienced it doesn't mean that you're going to experience it. So, exactly. So people can't get discouraged or you know it, it is scary it definitely is scary because when the last drug they had me that they just recently put me on was onfi and onfi had more side effects than my other two drugs combined you know because oh, wow. i take i take um i take uh trileptol i take i take um kepra and i take onfi and you know those medications had onfi had more side effects than the other two and it scared the hell out of me when they were going to put me on it but when they did put me on it 
I had no side effects. But so you really, you know, it's good to be educated, but don't be discouraged. If exactly. you try it and you have side effects and you don't like the way you feel, the doctor can slowly wean you off of it, but don't wean yourself off of it. But Absolutely. I'd love, I would love for you to tell people how it affects your self-esteem because you were talking about this before we started the show that, you know, because of the stigmatism, because your parents isolated you in your home, you had a hard time communicating with people on the outside world, making the transition from, you know, living at home, being bubble eyes, and then going into the real world and then trying to start a real life for yourself. You couldn't even look in people's eyes because you didn't have the communication skills or the self-esteem to do it. So tell people how that affected you, the way your parents isolated you, the way your family and the stigmatisms they, they put in your head, how that affected you emotionally. It, it affected me in a very negative way, emotionally and mentally, because I knew by these actions, I was different. And in my mind at the time is I was different, not in a good way. And, you know, I had really no one around me. I had one other friend who had epilepsy and thankfully she, she had absence seizures and she outgrew them. I'm so, I'm so happy to say, but besides her, no one else had epilepsy around me. I didn't know the Epilepsy Foundation existed. I didn't know of any resources I could reach out to to be, help with my depression. And to go from, I mean, my life was playing music. I, I learned to play and write music, playing with Legos. That, that's been my passion. That's really what has helped me get through all of this. I and like I, Legos. <laughs> I still play with Legos. I'm guilty. <laughs> And then to go out into the real world and be around people now, all of a sudden, I, I couldn't make eye contact. I was really scared around if people got too close, I found myself stepping back. I was afraid going into the world. It was, you know, a very frightening experience. And I found I wasn't really an introvert. I did enjoy being around people to a degree, but trying to have starting a conversation or trying to stay engaged it was really hard. I could be talking to someone and they'd be looking at me like, are you going to answer? I just had no idea what to say because I really, besides family and a couple of friends at school, never really had that connection on how to communicate. It took so long to be able to take a breath and relax and have a conversation. Well, a communication skills is something that's learned. And like we were yeah. talking about before the show, you know, when I was in college, I, I was going through so much stress. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to complete it because I was having nonstop seizures from the late night studying, from the stresses. And when I finally did achieve and, you know, that goal and I did get my college degree, I went and I started working for a big corporation in the city. And like I was telling you, I felt an aura. And I fell to the floor and I had a seizure and I was partially awake. I could, um, I was awake and I was having a partial seizure and the producer just walked right over me and kept walking. And I saw him and I was like, I remember saying to myself, I can't believe he just walked over me. And then 30 minutes later, the associate producer came over and said, oh, Stacey, I'm so sorry, but you don't make the requirements. And we all know why I was let go yeah. that day. And, you know, that stigmatism was out there, especially in the 90s. Nobody knew what epilepsy was. And no, that's you know, the truth. And it was people, you know, what you don't know, you fear. And that's the problem. And to this day, a lot of people don't even know what the Epilepsy Foundation is. When I mentioned the wow. Epilepsy Foundation, people, oh, really? You know, you would think they would know. But, you know, the stigmatism was out there and it still is out there because I, I was on, I'm on an advisory board for Syn uh, Synovium Pharmaceuticals. And it's, it's you know, it's it's the the people, the professionals there with, the, with patients. And we give our, we evaluate the, a lot of different issues. And and one of it was stigmatism and the stigmatism is still out there, you know, yes. but you people, ha you know, but what you went through was something similar that I went through, you know, we, it's, it's denial. You know, first you're in denial. You, your family was in denial. They didn't want to accept that you had epilepsy. And then it, you have to go through the process where you accept it. And then you have to learn how to love yourself. You know, they had yeah. to learn how to love you and say, 
you know what? She's great who she is. She's just like everybody else. And in their eyes, they weren't at that point yet, you know? And Absolutely. I understand because my father was from Greece. And to this day, I think he's still in a little bit of a denial. He knows I have it, but, you know, it's hard for him oh. to accept it. You know, he really is. And he admitted to me, he goes, hey, you know, it's hard for him to accept that I have epilepsy because it hurts him so much emotionally that I have to go through this, you know? And he saw be, me have seizures, you know? That would be something really good to connect, Natalie. If you can talk about, I think you mentioned something about some of your family accepted you some didn't you know yeah. what happened in that role when and what did you do to overcome it how do you help others now too when people don't accept you yeah well when it came to my family my mother well, both sides of my family we haven't been in the country that long i'm second and third generation over here when it came to my family my mother's family and i think it's because they grew up in more hardship. My grandmother immigrated from Belfast. She was working in a factory by the age of 14. She saw the hardship of how important it was for families to be together, living in a war zone because, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, nothing was balanced. They were on their toes all the time. I mean, you could go down the wrong, the, a certain street, and if you weren't of the right faith and people knew, it could get you in trouble or certain times in the year where there was protests or marches. You know, they, they were in fear of what went on. So family was everything to my uh, mother's family. You looked out for everyone, and she wanted me to have the best care and was angry with my mother because she felt my mother sided with my father about being silent. Now, my father's family is from the Middle East. They're Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, like you. And it was the same thing with my father because of him being an entrepreneur, his parents and grandparents, everyone had gone over here and their attitude was, we're not headed back that way. We're not going back to war zones. We're going to survive over here. So we can't make any foolish mistakes because if we do, we could very much be done for. And so that's the attitude they have. We need to be quiet. We don't, they don't need to know we have a sick child, especially one who has a sickness in the brain. So no discussing it. That's it. Just make sure she stays alive and we're leaving it at that. And I forgive them for it because of, um, Really, I that was the way they grew up. That was, yes. that was all, you know, you know, we, we get mad at their actions, but then you have to think about where they came from and exactly. how they were raised. And that's all they knew. That was the environment they came from, you know, and uh, like I was telling you before the show, like when I was looking for help, you know, I wrote a letter into the Epilepsy Foundation in their magazine and I asked them, you know, to please publish it. And I asked people, how do you get through epilepsy? Please tell me your story and tell me how you cope with epilepsy. And I had hundreds of letters from all over the United States and Canada come to me. And like I was telling you, that one letter always stuck in my head. There was one woman from Hawaii and her mother, you know, um, told her, don't say anything because you, people will think you're possessed. And she grew up thinking that she couldn't say anything because she was possessed. She was, you know, like an evil spirit, an evil witch, you know, like there was oh something wrong with her. And, you know, it's, 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 it's how they're the environment they're raised and then the problem is it's how their parents raise them so how our parents raise them how us our, our parents raise us has a big impact and sometimes you could realize their mistakes and you could work on changing yourself to better yourself and then sometimes people just don't know how and they you know like we were talking about low self-esteem both you and i suffered from low self-esteem that's one of the reasons why you couldn't look people in the eye you said you had a hard yeah. time looking people in the eye well it was because you were bubbleized one because and you so you had no communication skills communication skills is something you acquire and yes. then low self-esteem when you don't feel good about yourself it's very hard to look somebody in the eye and talk to them so those are two huge things that you had to overcome and i had to overcome that low self-esteem too i was not bubbleized but I had definitely low self-esteem. I was more like a follower back then than I, I than a leader. And it was something I had to, it took years to, to learn how to acquire those skills, but anybody can acquire those skills. Oh yeah. And I mean, when I first went into college, I found, um, I allowed the stigma to get to me. And when people found out I had epilepsy, especially people in academics, it was almost like a little bit of a baby talk, like, oh, this is so sweet that you're following your dreams. Oh my goodness, you're so special. And I'm thinking- I'm so sorry for you. Yeah. yeah. And I'm that's, like, that's I'm, I'm, not, 
I'm not in preschool. I don't need my my little gold star on on the poster. I'm a grown woman who has goals in life. I'm not going yeah. to isolate myself. And I would have people say, oh, you can't get through this program. You can't do that. And the anger just came out of me and I went, really, I can't. I'm like, step aside. I'm going to show you how it's done. <laughs> but it wasn't in a positive <laughs> way. I mean, as good as it feels to say that at that time, it You're wasn't angry. confidence. It was anger. Like, give me a break, man. Take a hike. I'm taking care of me. Right. And it took a long time to get the anger to um, diminish. And even still, sometimes I'll be the first to admit, does it creep up at times? Oh, yeah. I mean, I recently I just joined um, the regional chamber of commerce at where I am. And I'm working with organizations to um, grow, not just grow my organization, but to help them with helping others in the community. But I originally joined the smaller one. And I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs would not have a conversation with me because I was diseased in their mind. Oh my I, had, God. I had one entrepreneur come up to me after he heard me speak one day and he goes, you come off as so smart. He goes, I'd never oh hire you. And I went, well, I, I, I appreciate your honesty that you're being honest and forthcoming with me. I go, may I ask why you would never hire someone like me? He goes, well, what if you had a seizure on the job and you got hurt? I don't oh want you God. suing me. That, what if you had a seizure in front like, of Did you tell him that that's job discrimination and he just put himself in a lawsuit right then and there <laughs> by saying that to you? <laughs> they don't realize it. So many what of them if, don't what realize if I, if don't it. Him, what if I said, oh, I'm 10 years sober and they go, well, oh, gosh, we don't hire you because you drank in the past. See you later. Oh, like, my gosh. That, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And I mean, I told him, I said, OK, even if you're afraid of those things. I go, we're in the 21st century. I go, people are looking now more than ever for business owners of all levels to diversify and really build a, a good team that's structured with many people who have been through different walks of life. Right. I said, let's say you needed someone for data entry or accounting, and I met the qualifications. If you're scared, I'm going to get hurt on the job there. I go, we have, look at the technology we have. I could work from home doing the books, send you stuff in Dropbox, and we can meet once a week by Zoom, and I can update you on what's going on and everything. You don't even need to have me there. There's it doesn't even make like sense, that. though, because everybody has something. And what happens yes. if you have a heart condition? You're susceptible to having a heart attack on, on the job. You Thank know what I'm saying? You. If you have diabetes, you could have, you know, something could happen to you and you could end up, ha you know, falling down on the floor and passing out because your sugar level is so high all of a sudden. You know, maybe you didn't take your medicine. Maybe you're not taking care of yourself. You know, there's so many things that could happen. You know, we oh, can yeah. go through every disease you know high cholesterol you're opening yourself to sugar you know to, to stroke <laughs> you know so that that doesn't even make sense you know every everybody has a condition you know you have a you have you suffer from stress you could have a panic attack on, on yeah. while you're working so excuse me that makes no sense whatsoever you no. know people you know people don't think you know it's just it's just uh because they don't understand that it's not and educated enough in our society people have to really just like they do with diabetes breast cancer cancer and and all the other stuff you know that they put on tv about high blood pressure high cholesterol well there should be more commercials and they should be more shows talking about epilepsy what yes. it is and you know why not to fear it and just how we're just like everybody else because you like you know unless you don't unless you understand it you're going to fear it and so people yes. need in our society to be educated so the stigmatism decreases and it hasn't it has decreased somewhat but not enough not not enough no not enough and I find the only time I could say I've gotten angry in the last year or two about um, having epilepsy, what well, was two things. I ended up getting COVID. I had long haul COVID and into when I was battling COVID, I picked up a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. I had no idea I had this and I got so sick that, I mean, I almost died. One night I came to the computer. I was doing a research project with a professor of mine. He was doing, uh, he was putting together a journal article I didn't know how to write. Now, this is my passion. I love research. I love writing. I love so do I. Yeah. And I'm just looking at the screen going, I don't know what to do with it. And that's right. when I I'm like, I'm dying. 
The fact that I can't do what I love more than anything, I'm dying. And thankfully, when I called my doctor, they put me through to the um, the state. The state called me back. And when I had the discussion with the doctor and told him my symptoms, he's like, this is more than COVID. And he prescribed me antibiotics. He said, if you're not better in 10 days, you are to call me here. And I knew that was his way of saying, girl, you're dying. If you don't listen to me, you don't got much longer. Mm -hmm. I knew that was, he was sending a, a real firm message and thank goodness he did. He saved my life. Right. But so many people, it was a, str it was a struggle over a year yeah. to get this infection out of my system. I was having some small seizures, some simple partial seizures as my brain was healing. Mm -hmm. And some days I could work just fine. And some days I just had to go back to bed. So well, people COVID assume, made people very foggy, you know, yeah. you know, people, especially in the beginning strands, when they were more stronger, the strands, a lot of people became very foggy. And yet that's one of the symptoms that occurred, you know, even after the fact, you know, yeah. um, people were very feeling very foggy, couldn't think straight, their clarity, their focus was completely off. And that's what you experienced as well. Yeah. But the attitude other people ha had towards me because they knew I had epilepsy, the attitude, oh, she's just lazy. She doesn't want to do this. You know, she, she's not as dedicated. And it's like, no, I mean, I'll be honest at some level or another, I work every day. I love it. I try to work only so much a day because my family comes first, Right. but there were days I literally came here. I could work an hour. And I was completely burnt out because of COVID and the infection. And so many people were so, you know, they had no empathy whatsoever. It's like, okay. You're also you taking can't. medication as well. So yeah. you have a lot of things, you know, going against you. You know, sickness puts stress on the body. Body, you know, when the body is in stress, you could have seizures. So you're fighting an infection. You're also dealing with epilepsy and the seizures and the aftermath of the seizures. And you take, you take medication for your epilepsy and you're taking other medication now to help you with these other illnesses. So think yeah. about how many things you're battling. And it's the same for other people, you know, and people don't realize that because then, you know, people don't take enough of time to, to think about the person and put themselves in their shoes and walk, Absolutely. Through, walk through their shoes. I, you know, I always say, you know what, you can make easy judgments about someone, but stop for a second, think about them, think about who they are. And if you know enough about them, put yourself in their shoes and then think about how, you know, how you would react, you know, and what you would say, because I'm sure if people walk through your shoes, they're going to realize, you know what, my comment was unfair. I'm sorry. I can see where you're coming from now. Yeah. And not enough people have the capability to do that. I just find when it comes to chronic illness and even especially invisible illnesses, yes, they mm -hmm. look at you and they're like, what? you don't look sick. What's wrong with you? Right. Well, I may not look sick, but you know, each day is a new day. There's days I feel great. I'm on top of the world. I have energy. I'm ready. Just I'm ready to face the world and give a hundred percent. And then there's days I've just sat here since having COVID. I've had chronic pain, and I just had to go on Lyrica recently for my chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And my body would feel like it was on fire. I just oh, yeah. hurt, and I would try my best to ignore the pain. And I finally couldn't ignore it. One day it got so bad. I mean, it was to the point I was crying. That oh, was the yeah. only way I could deal with it. And I wrote my neurologist. I said, I can't do this anymore. I swear I'm really trying, but I just can't do this anymore. And thankfully, I have a wonderful neurologist where there would have been so many who would have gone, well, go to your primary doctor and get a referral. This is out of my scope. Why are you telling me this? I told him and he goes, well, the first thing we got to do we got to get you the pain management. Is this something like an autoimmune disease? Is it fibromyalgia or is it somatic pain, you know, from past trauma and you don't realize something still is, is there something's bothering you and it's in, right. your, in your subconscious still. Right. And pain is very hard. I suffer from pain, you know, and it is very, very hard. You know, there were times where I couldn't even pick up a coffee cup. I was in so much pain yes. and, you know, 
it's very hard to live life when you are in pain. It's very hard to get out of bed. And that could also affect depression too. Because it when does. you are in so much pain and you can't do the things you love, you're thinking about what you used to, con used to, could, used to be able to do versus what you can do now. That's very depressing. And that's very upsetting to an individual who's suffering from pain. And you just want to get help. You're desperate to get help because nobody wants to feel pain. You can't. It's very hard hard to live a productive life when you are in pain you know and I had to reach out and get the right help to to, to help me with pain management because it's very difficult to live life productively when you are in pain and it can be very depressing as well mentally and physically it affects you so it you know it's it's something that you know and so many people in our world suffer from pain because when I write articles and I post things about pain and pain management I can't tell you how many people come on and even videos because so many people in our world suffer from pain and you know even with epilepsy how many people hurt themselves when they have a seizure oh yeah I, I mean I, oh I've, about lo it. I've lost count of my injuries how many bones I've broken <laughs> yeah me bones too. I've broken oh, concussions oh, do you see the groups we're on? You're probably all in the same groups but they, they have people all just messed up I cracked my head open one time in a locker room and I had this huge gash and, and I see, but people lose their teeth, they break mm -hmm. their bones, car accidents, everything. Uh, one thing I wanna chime in too is about the, the lockdown that we went through. I think more people can understand what it's like to lose your freedom. They had to be yes. at home. I, I had uh, speaking programs with kids in high school and I'll never forget like 800 kids were on the Zoom call and they all looked the same. They were all locked in their room. They were all just sitting there like either on their phone or trying to pay attention they had lost everything. They couldn't drive. They couldn't go outside. And it kind of connected with me saying, this is just like epilepsy. They're going to understand more. So I think there's a real connectivity to where and why this happened for COVID, but everything connected to how we can help people. So I love that you're all, we're all connected too in this area. Oh yeah. And I think it was an eye open for a lot of people because I, you know, I like it now every day, even if it's something as simple as going out into my garden I have to get out because I find getting some fresh air and the sunshine really helps with um, reducing my depression. And two weeks into COVID, I had a horrible panic attack here in the house. And then once my panic attack came down, I started to cry. And my husband's like, it's okay, what's wrong? And I said, I want out of the house. I just want out of the house so bad. And he's like, it's going to be okay. And then what was weird was after I got real sick, I mean, I, I took myself off the road, even though I wasn't since at that point, I'm like, I was so afraid with the brain fog. I yeah. would hurt somebody and never forgive myself. So for almost seven months, I didn't drive and I was so weak. The one thing I, I do that it, it's like my PTSD medicine was exercise. I couldn't focus. Exercise is great. Yeah. I, I couldn't walk on the treadmill. Yeah. I couldn't lift weights. And I power lifted before. Um, Isn't that terrible when you could, you're able to do one thing and then you get to a point and you can't do those things anymore? It feels, yeah. it's very, it's emotionally, it's very hard. I didn't drive for 15 years. When they were trying to get my seizures under control, they asked me not to drive. And I didn't drive for 15 years. I felt in prison in my own home. And oh, that's yeah. how many people probably felt when, when, you know, when we had lockdown, you know, it's, it's a terrible feeling to be locked and feel imprisoned in your own home because you can't, you know, you can't do the things you want to do. You want to get in the car and you want to go out here or do this and this. You can't do that. You know, it was like, okay, I have to pick up the phone and ask somebody, can you please take me here? And I could only ask for things for necessary things because and I didn't even want to do that because I didn't want to inconvenience people. And you hear that all the time. Well, I don't want to inconvenience anybody. And you're not really because like people who offered to help me loved me and they wanted to be there for me yeah. but you know people who who are on the other side of the of the rope feel like oh I, I feel like a big inconvenience and that's where yeah. the depression falls in it's, and it's very it's very it's a very hard thing to deal with when you feel you know but I'm glad that you took responsibility and that you knew that you probably shouldn't drive so you took yourself you know and you were responsible to say okay I'm going to stay off the road until I feel better and that's something you know very I'm very you know that you know hands on to you because Thank you. you know there are people out there that do drive that shouldn't drive and yes. you know and you know you're only you're only 
causing, um, you know, the, you could hurt somebody, you, you oh, can kill yeah. somebody and you can kill yourself, you know, you have to be responsible, you know, and uh, so kudos for you. I think the only frustration I have is despite us having the ADA, I feel that um, our communities do not consider how important public transportation like buses or the, tra the metro or things really are for people with all disabilities and differences. I was in Slovenia in May. I, when I graduated from my master's, I had um, taken part while going to school in the study abroad program. Mm -hmm. And as an alumni, I can, I can go for a discounted price. So my husband and I went and I met a gentleman. They had a little, um, I bought this there. They do a little craft store. Mm -hmm. And they have about 3,000 people in Slovenia who just cannot work due to severe autism, other learning disabilities and stuff. And so this is their way. They bring them all together in little groups. They socialize. They make friends. They do these hands-on um, crafts to help with their motor skills. And what was really interesting is I was talking to this gentleman. He was a quadriplegic. He said, in our constitution, Elder and disabled people have full rights, and the government has set it up where they take responsibility and help people who are disabled. He, he said, if you were living here, once you finished school, they would have made sure you were in a program to improve your working skills and would have made sure you had gainful employment so you could contribute to our communities. And he said, that's excellent. He said, the ones who can't, we do everything we can to keep them engaged. And he said, I lived in Pennsylvania with my family for a few years. He goes, I had to come back here for my emotional and mental health because I was alienated. I went from being with my community and around people to being with no one. And I just couldn't take it. And what I loved there was when I, I was in the capital in Ljubljana, they had a shuttle where if you were elder or disabled, let's say I had to get groceries or I had a doctor appointment. Yes. I could call and make an appointment saying, I have to be the doctor at this time. When I finish, I can call you or I need to get groceries. Can you drop me off here? I'll be here in an hour waiting when I'm done. No charge. That's excellent. They made sure people got the necessities they needed. They made sure people had access to be able to get to the care they needed. And they were able, despite their age or medical condition, to be mm -hmm. able to be part of society. And I thought to myself, here, this little country of about 3 million people stuck, you know, in Central Europe, look what they're doing for the community. And That's then I came, I came back home and I said, why can't we be doing the same thing? We why should be doing the same yeah, thing. And why can't we all come together and do something for the next generation and do what we can to improve our communities? Because I think I mean, sometimes our society thinks too much about the dollar bill and they don't think yes. enough about the people. And they don't think of the long-term benefit. They don't no. realize investing in others, they can get a return. I was telling um, entrepreneurs out here, I said 70% of people with epilepsy, their seizures are controlled, but they hide in fear because they're worried if they lose their jobs, they're done. I right. go, instead of isolating people who have epilepsy, take make sure all 70% have employment. I go think of the economic growth we could have if they all had jobs, they were all paying taxes. Think of what it would do to the GDP out here, what we could do to keep community stronger. And until I put money on it, they don't understand. The moment I say, oh, they're paying taxes now, areas are growing, it's like the light bulb goes off. Oh, I never thought about that. I'm like, yeah, I go, you discriminate and stigmatize people. You're right. not just hurting that community. You hurt yourself. Everyone gets hurt. Exactly. And they just, they were in shock when I put it that way. But that's true. You know, people have to realize that, you know, they could be such a benefit to society if you were able to provide the necessary facilities and, and you know, the utilities that they, to help people so they can actually go into the working world and be a part of the working world and, you know, and, and then provide also, you know, about 
like we, we were talking about, people have to have the the confidence and the and the courage to know that they can do it because when you when you isolate yourself for so many years and you're not able to do these things you develop a fear you oh, develop absolutely. a fear to get in a car to go places to do things i can't do that i'm not good enough to do that i have epilepsy i can't do that oh yes you can yes. you know and then once you get them out there and you get them to do it they realize yes i can do it wow oh my god i can do do it, it you know yeah. old you the, the new you right and then if we're stuck in that way of having a seizure you lose your license you're there for two years five years you 15 years right you're just thinking to yourself i can't do it i can't do it and you get stuck in that mode and i wanted to connect with natalie tell us about your your business itself and how you're helping others and you know just any any projects you have going on what's upcoming in your in your business there well, we have two projects right now. What we do for education, we have a blog where I have um, interns who are pre-med majors, nursing, psychology, who want to learn and gain experience. So we have different articles about epilepsy conditions associated with it for people to learn about. And I take the articles and I turn them into videos for the YouTube channel for our visual learners. And then what we do for our projects, we have a scholarship that we award to students with epilepsy because I, I'm very passionate about education and I I feel everyone should have a right to education, not a selected few. And then mm -hmm. for people who have uncontrolled epilepsy, along with veterans who have developed epilepsy or traumatic brain injury, PTSD, mm -hmm. we're working now with the regional chamber and other organizations out here to start helping people get the funding for medical alert dogs to help them with their condition. But my long-term passion, what I'm working on now with a couple of my um, board members, I want to create, along with the scholarship, a workforce development program to help people with resumes, helping with interview techniques, how to strengthen their LinkedIn profiles, because there's so many who come out of college and it's like, okay, I have the degree. Now, how do I find a job? How do I approach this? And when you were talking about confidence, a lot of them are just too scared to take that next step. So I want them to see they have the support system. They have the tools. They can learn the skills. There's no reason for them not to achieve and have a happy and healthy life. I just want to see the next generation have a better educational, economic opportunities, better health care, and know that they can stand up for themselves and live. And one of the hardest things I think it's been for people with epilepsy because of the past in the 80s and 90s when we grew up, when they don't feel right about something, they're so afraid to say no. And I yeah. want people to know, advocate for yourself. If something doesn't feel right, be honest. And at the end of the day, if it's not working anymore, you have every right as an individual with a chronic illness to look at your doctor or the nurse practitioner and say, it's not working. Right. What is the next option? Because so many people I've met, one, they don't even know they can do that. But then two, well, what if I make the doctor angry and the doctor doesn't want to work with me anymore? If the doctor dismisses you because you're trying to advocate for yourself, that's not a doctor you want to have. Not you at want all. To have, you want to have a doctor who is a team player. Yes. And you can be honest and straightforward with. And I mean, that's why I, I just feel so lucky to have the doctor I have because not only can I be honest about what's happening with my epilepsy, but when it comes to my emotional mental health, how things are, I can talk about how things are going on with work if I'm having stressors. And, you know, I love that he thinks outside the box. He was the first one when um, I was talking to him one day, he said, so what are you and your husband doing about birth control? I never had a doctor say, what are you doing so you don't have an unplanned pregnancy? It threw me off a little. I was like, oh, wow. I'm like, well, baby baking days are over. And he started laughing. He goes, oh, I get it. Trust me. I know you have your hands full, but you still are at an age where you can see, can see. So yes. I'm going to ask again what are you doing to make sure that doesn't happen? And I thought, this is the doctor I've been waiting for for years. I had so many other doctors where, ill. I don't talk about that. You know, you talk to the OBGYN about it. And the added to what I'm trying to teach people, I, I um, put together a sexual wellness series on our YouTube channel. That's good. And, and I said, you have to take control of your well-being and do what you can 
to have an unplanned pregnancy, and if you want to get pregnant, your neurologist has to be part of that team. Oh, it's 100%. Not just the OBGYN. No. Everyone has to come together for this life you plan on creating. There can't be no miscommunication, especially, you know, in such a serious situation, what some of these medications can do to a baby. I wrote a book on epilepsy and pregnancy, and my I wrote it with a doctor um, from St. Barnabas. I, I believe that doctor now is an at NYU, and um, you know, there's a lot of also fear. You know, people don't realize a lot of people, women with epilepsy, don't think they could have children, or they yeah. they fear that they might not be able to breastfeed, and that's not true. They could breastfeed, you know, yeah. and they you know, and they could have healthy children. We're high risk pregnancies, but we I have three healthy healthy children. And, you know, you know, God bless. I had great pregnancies, you know, and yeah. I wrote about those pregnancies and I put a lot of information back by the medical journals and science with my own personal stories. And, you know, one thing I hopped from doctor to doctor to doctor until I found the right epileptologist. And when I found the right epileptologist, I tell people, you can't, you, first of all, communication is key. You have to be honest oh, yes. with your doctor because you're not going to get the proper help one, unless you're honest with your doctor. And two, you have to be your own doctor too. I used to have come in with my calendar when I was going to ovulate, when I was going to menstruate, how many seizures did I have? How many auras did I have? How did I feel? What was I eating? And I also, I also did my homework. Like I did a lot of research. I wanted to understand what epilepsy was, what I could do, what drugs were available to, available to me i heard that this this you know people are saying this is this true you know and i can i had lists of questions you know i i didn't co just go in there and you know say okay what should i do and then get a script and walk right out exactly. i had intense conversations with my epileptologist and my epileptologist was part of my pregnancy and there were some discrepancies because the obgyns know nothing about epilepsy they just know no. the generalized information they were you know all doctors doctors are just taught generalized information about epilepsy, but the epileptologists are, that's all they do is they focus on epilepsy. And my doctor, you know, was a very big part of my, my, my pregnancies. And he, and he worked very closely with the OBGYN. And, you know, I had my children at eight and a half months instead of nine months because my, so much movement I had in, in my body that it was causing it caused me to have a seizure and the doctors did not want to take it well my epileptologist not want to take a chance of me having a seizure not being able to properly breathe and then maybe the god forbid ha, you know having a problem with the child or any type of you know oh, yeah. any any problems you know and uh so you know to play it safe we had my children at eight and a half months and you know my OBGYN was not in favor of that but they explained very clearly the importance of having a healthy child and what seizures can do and you know and the medications I was taking so yes you have to have a, a very big role with your doctors and have your, your epileptologist a part of that because they're not good other doctors that's, are that's not going to understand like, it mentally physically emotionally because you go to it sounds like of course I don't have kids <laughs> from a woman's view OBGYN is physical you know they want to check you so they're checking you physically but what about mentally and emotionally and everything you're talking about that epileptologist is going to be the person to speak to about that about what's going on you know in your mentally and emotional state right right yes. mm -hmm. you know it, and and they know the information they know what the you know my doctor specifically had me on a medication that was doing very well in europe um, for people who are pregnant, you know, pregnant, um, they had, you know, it, it there was no uh, negative side effects, you know, and people that were pregnant did very well on this drug. So when I, you know, when I was pregnant, he also put me on this medication and the medication controlled my seizures fabulously. So not only did it, it control my seizures well, it was also healthy for, you know, versus other drugs when I was pregnant. You know, some drugs are not very, you know, aren't very good to, to use while you're pregnant. So, you know, you have to have, you know, you have to have good communication and honesty is key. You're yes. never going to get the proper help if you're not honest, you know, and people are afraid to be honest with their doctor. They're afraid what their doctor will do. Maybe their doctor won't, you know, maybe their doctor will take away their driving rights. Maybe their doctor will do this. Maybe their doctor will do that. But you know what? You're not going to get better unless you're honest with your doctor.
Oh, that's the truth. And, and I like how you brought up the point with other doctors not really understanding other conditions that are outside of their scope. And I found not only in um, medicine does that happen, but my husband is a dentist, he's a periodontist. And I can't tell you how many general dentists really don't understand chronic illness. They no. understand the basics of taking care of people, but I can't tell you how many general dentists did not want to take care of my teeth, did not want to take care of me. They were scared to death. And one of my husband's students, he's a general dentist, but he did extensive training and he works with the regional center. And about a third of his patients have epilepsy. And when we talked one day, he's like, when's the last time you lost consciousness? I said, 2004. He goes, did you, do you have auras? I said, yes, I do. I'll, I can tell you when to stop. And he goes, what's the problem then? I said, thank you. I've been thinking that for years too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is either. And he's like, well, you're welcome to be a patient here. I said, thank you. But mm -hmm. so many have, you know, just like one of my husband's colleagues, he was scared to death to touch me. And I said, it's okay. I promise. I said, things haven't happened in years, but if something happens, I go, I will be the first to let you know. I will let you know what's going on. And yeah, it, it, I had to like break everything down to a T before he just like relaxed and went, okay, we can do this. I had the same problem with an allergist. When I went to the allergist, the allergist was afraid to give me anything for my allergies because he, as soon as I said I had epilepsy and, and I said what medications I was on, but he didn't knew nothing. I'm like, oh, I could take, you know, I could take that kind of spray. Yeah. It's not going to do anything to me, you know, but they, the look of fear, you know, as soon as I said the word epilepsy and I take medications for epilepsy, you could see he had he was know, scared to death yeah he was scared to death because he was clueless he didn't understand what epilepsy was and he didn't understand the medications you know and i'm trying to tell him i can take this kind of spray i could take this kind of allergy medicine it won't do anything but you could see he was just afraid to these, do anything yeah these these doctors aren't used to it too i think a lot a high percentage of doctors i sold pharmaceutical drugs by the way and i understood how the the doctors would listen to you when you described a drug and then they would take that knowledge and use it so just recently, last year, I went in, I didn't want to get the vaccine because I had the, the epilepsy. I didn't want to get triggered. I go to a doctor and I say, can I get a written excuse or, you know, a reason not to get it? And he goes, no, you have to go to a specialist. I go to a specialist. I go to a neurologist. And the neurologist is just sitting there taking all these notes, listening to my story. And he couldn't believe I was not on medication. I haven't been on for 10 years. And he's oh, sitting wow. there look, looking at me. I mean, I've been off. I've been seizure free. I've been sober. Everything changed in my life. No medication, no seizures. He just couldn't wrap his mind around it. He was busy on his laptop the whole time. And he said, you should get an EEG. So I got an EEG in January. On January 13th, ironically, on my birthday. And I took the EEG. I meditated. I thought, this will be great. I just was all positive. He gets the results back. And he says, you have a dormant tissue. He calls me two weeks later and says, there's a dormant tissue. And it could return at any time. So he was CYA, I covered, <laughs> cover your ass. And <laughs> he could not um, understand the idea that if I changed my life, if I sobered up, no more epilepsy. So he CYA'd and he took my license away. I lost my driver's license in January for two weeks. And wow. that's such BS because didn't even refer me anywhere. Didn't say anything. Didn't ask about my past history. Really didn't care. He was just like, why did you come here? I can't give you a vaccine uh, exemption. I can't do that. You need to get an EG. When I got the EG, it wasn't about the vaccine anymore. It was about my freaking life. And I lost my license and that whole trauma came back, PTSD, post-traumatic seizure disorder, I call it. And I couldn't understand what am I going through? I lost everything. I can't drive anymore. So the freedom I have was taken away even without epilepsy. It's the whole, the whole system going back to what you're saying. I just wanted to add that. No, yeah. it's, it's very true. That's why I think when we first establish relationships with doctors, we are afraid to be straightforward until we get a feeling of um, their personality. Because I had doctors where, like my doctor now, he knows after all these years, I know my body and I tell him, you know, I haven't had a seizure in a very long time, but if I have a headache, I'm still not risking it. Or if I'm having right. real bad fatigue one day, I'm handing my husband the keys. 
Well, so, those are those are signs. Our body yeah. gives us signs. We know when we have to take a step back and relax. You have to know your body. And that's something that I teach is you have to understand the triggers. You have to understand your body and your body gives you messages when it's saying, hey, I need to rest. You know, you can't push me anymore. I, I need to you need to take a step back and give me some time to renew myself. Yes. And, you know, for, for the vaccine, the vaccine, you know, I just want to make make it clear that people with epilepsy can take the vaccine. It doesn't cause seizures. Like, you know, the hospitals that I'm affiliated with were actually, you know, were, um, you know, you know, recommending that we yeah. get the vaccine. So the vaccine doesn't cause epilepsy or seizures to occur. You know, um, you know, having scar tissue, you know, that's one of the reasons why people have seizures. Is, you know, yeah. I have scar tissue throughout my entire brain that they can't even see. They don't know where the scar tissue is, but they know I have it. And, you know, and people, when, when you have epilepsy, you know, you can become controlled even with the scar tissue. And, but, you know, once we have epilepsy, it's a disorder that doesn't go away. You know, exactly. Stefan is controlled, um, but, you know, it could always come back off of it, you know, but the, the vaccine itself is not going to trigger the, the seizure, you know, um, you know, getting the vaccine could actually prevent your body from going through such a traumatic trauma because it doesn't prevent the COVID, it just makes the symptoms, you know, you not, go as, through, bad. not yeah. as bad, which could actually help your epilepsy, you know? So, um, you know, that's just a, just a word of advice for people that might be afraid to take the vaccine because, you know, it, it was something that came upon us very quickly. And a lot of people didn't know for a lot of information about it, but I just wanted to say that. Well, I got the vaccine, I got Pfizer and the first two injections, I did real well. Now, when mm -hmm. I hit the booster, I don't know why I got a cluster headache from it and I had to rest for a day, but after 24 hours, I was fine again. Mm -hmm. But I, I really would, you know, I don't want to tell people what to do with their bodies, exactly. but I think it's a very responsible thing to get the uh, vaccination because I could say from having long haul COVID, it really, I already have a suppressed immune system. Mm -hmm. it, it put me in such a bad spot that like I said, I'm lucky to be alive because of that one doctor. But right. I think where I really got frustrated when COVID um, first happened and they started who could get um, the vaccinations when it was 65 and older, a friend of mine who is an advocate, her daughter has um, a bleeding condition like my son's, but she has a lot of rare illnesses. She, you know, poor thing. she's had a very difficult life due to health challenges. She said to um, some of the politicians she knew, why are people who are disabled or immunocompromised, the ones who are really at risk, why aren't they in the 65 plus category? Why are you not getting on this now? And they're like, we well, actually, we're going by age. We actually, they knew, they changed that very quickly because- Oh, you did know, they? Good. They did because um, once I, when, when I, when I mentioned I have epilepsy, the, 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 the epilepsy communities pushed it and we, it was changed very quickly because people who had um, disorders, you know, and had um, specific diseases, they knew the importance of them getting the vaccine. So that changed very quickly. I was like one of the first to get it when it first came out because, you know, yeah. they, the epilepsy community, you know, was able to up you on the list. So it was, it was changed very quickly. They realized that the need for that. So it started like oh. that, but it changed extremely quick. Because I know they had a petition, but one of the frustrations I had where I would, I'm out here in Rancho Cucamonga, it was very polarized. There were some people who we need to get it, we need to mask. And then there were people, oh, you're not going to force me to put that on my body. You can't force me to wear a mask. I have the rights not to wear a mask. It was so divided. And mm. it really, for a while, thank goodness now things have calmed down, but it caused a lot of tension in the community. I mean, when I was okay. wearing a mask, I had some people around me giving me look like, oh, you're going along with this. And I'm thinking, uh, I, I don't want to die. Yeah. I don't want to end up on disability. I don't want this to take over. So, you know, if it works or not, this is my peace of mind right now. Right now I'm going to wear one. And when I feel safe not to wear one, I'll take it off. Right. But, you know, I think, I think due to, um, 
like you said, fear. We didn't know enough about it. And then with conflicting information, people's, people thought, who do I believe? Are they right. really doing right by us? Should I really be doing this? Or should I be making my own decision if it's right or not? So, I mean, I can, I can empathize with those who are like, no, I'm not taking it. No, mm -hmm. I feel it's going to cause more harm than good. Right. No, I don't feel I should have to wear a mask. I'm going to find other precautions to take. I, I got it. I real I really did understand their point of view. And yeah. I think if this had been handled, you know, I don't even want to say government, but just other people in you know general, you know, who are supposed to be, you know, public health and stuff, if we had had a more concrete plan, I think people would have been more relaxed and more willing to comply with with it rather than are they really being honest with us or is this, are they manipulating us? Right. I agree. .org, and you can contact me at info at defeating epilepsy.org or our number is area code 909-740-4461. And if you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm here for the community. Thank you so much, Natalie. It was a Thank pleasure you. speaking with you. Always a pleasure speaking with you and anything I can do to um, help in any way, I'm more than happy to come back and do what I can to help educate the community. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So it was a great.